What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Elden Ring. Now this has honestly been a bit of a life-consuming endeavor since this game released, and honestly I'm ready to get this review done and put the game down for a little bit, frankly. That said, reviews after 100% are something I do very often. It does include more than just the achievements. However, it does also include the achievements. My Steam profile is linked down below. It's public. Feel free to check it out if you want. Which means, of course, that I did play this on PC, which I note very specifically because some people have an issue playing this kind of game with keyboard and mouse. So for starters, I play with a gamepad, not my actual keyboard. And secondly... I had to remap basically all the keys. The key bindings for PC are terrible. I moved all of them. I will be trying to avoid spoilers in this review. Most of the footage should pretty much be from early game stuff. I'm going to try to avoid showing too much for people trying to just get a feel for the game, etc. or just hear opinions. Mostly trying to avoid spoilers as much as possible. And if this is the first review of mine you're watching, I'm going to go through a bunch of stuff and then give some opinions at the end. But just to sort of set the stage here a little bit, Elden Ring is, of course, a third-person action RPG that has been highly, highly anticipated. And as with anything like that, there are a lot of opinions about it. Right off the bat, it is, of course, from developer From Software, which is known for a very particular style of game, and Elden Ring is no exception. If you've played any of their other games, you're going to feel right at home here. However, Elden Ring is very much so the most accessible of all of the games that they have produced thus far. It still maintains that level of difficulty that they're known for. However, it adds the new thing of being an open world game. And frankly, like all of From Software's games, I do ultimately think this game will be very polarizing like all of the others they have made, where either you're a big fan of the difficulty and overcoming that challenge, or you're just not. But with all that said, let's dive into this game, talk about some things, and then I'll give more opinions and stuff at the end. First up, we have our story set up. No spoilers here, literally just what you learn in the first few minutes of the game. From the intro, we gather that there was an actual Elden Ring that was shattered. It seems to have originally belonged to the goddess Merica, who's nowhere to be found all of a sudden. However, when the ring was shattered, all of her offspring, the Shardbearers as they're now known, took up their shards of the Elden Ring and tried to claim its power. There was a big war called the Shattering. Didn't really work out for anybody, and now beings known as the Tarnished are being awoken from death more or less, and tasked with gathering up all of the shards of the Elden Ring and becoming the next Elden Lord, which is our main goal for the game. Now there is definitely more to it than that, but for spoilers sake we're going to leave it right there. However, I will say there are three endings to the game. I would say there's the default ending, which is kind of just the ending really. There's the good ending, which requires more legwork, and then there's the bad ending, which ironically also requires a lot of legwork. And broadly speaking about the story, it is, like most of From Software's games, fairly vague in a lot of senses. However, they did an excellent job with the world building, and I felt like the ending was pretty satisfying. But the way they handle the lore, etc., it's difficult to follow everything if you're not paying very close attention to it. So I can definitely see people getting to the end of this game and having no idea what's going on. But from there, let's talk character creation a bit. So we're going to pick our class. There are several to choose from. Classes are important. They decide your starting stats and equipment, which will give you a kind of push in the appropriate direction for an initial build. However, they do also offer a blank slate class known as the Wretch, who can basically be molded into anything you want them to be, but they start off with no equipment and no discernible talents. Now, from here, we pick our stats. Now, while your class will decide your starting stats, it's still important to understand what they are, so we'll go from there. Stats can largely be divided into two categories, in my opinion. Stats that increase your resources and stats that increase your damage. So your resource stats are pretty much vigor, mind, and endurance. These are going to increase your health, your, I believe it's focus points, but I just call it mana, and your stamina, all of which are pretty self-explanatory if you've ever played an RPG. You need to raise those stats to have more of those things. And then everything else is pretty much a damage stat. However, the exact amount of damage you're getting out of these stats changes depending on what you are doing. More often than not, the abilities you're using, as well as the weapons you are using, scale off of certain stats. In some cases, they scale off of more than one stat. And the amount that weapon scales off of those stats is also variable. So ideally, you want to pick a way you would like to play the game, and then make your 
primary damage stat fall in line with that. In terms of progression, in classic Soulsborne fashion, we are going to be picking up runes, and these runes serve as everything currency and XP-wise. You will gather so many. When you have enough, you can go to a Site of Grace, which we'll get to in a minute, and then level your character up. But again, these runes do also serve as your currency, so you will be using them to buy items, etc. However, this is an open world game, so right off the bat, there are ways to absolutely cheese the amount of runes you're getting at any point in the game, which, if you want to abuse a little bit, can trivialize the difficulty that this game is known for. Now, each level, you're going to get exactly one attribute point to increase your attributes with, so progression can be a little bit slow at times. The progression itself is actually tied to the story a little bit. When you visit your third site of grace, an NPC will show up and offer you a covenant that will actually allow you to use the runes to level up, and she will also gift you a spirit horse, which serves as your mount throughout the game. But I just wanted to point out that this woman is the person that is supposed to be allowing you to use these runes to upgrade yourself, etc. And the last thing I want to mention on character creation is that the max points you can put into any one stat is 99, and you can keep leveling up until every stat is maxed. Though once you get to around level 170 or so, that's when progression can be much more challenging, as at that point you're looking at like 200,000 runes per level up which takes a while even with some farming methods. So if you're really looking to do everything New Game Plus included, because there is a New Game Plus, you're probably looking at like levels two to 300, I would imagine, you know, depending on how aggressively you'd like to level up. Now, after character creation, you're just kind of unceremoniously kicked out into the world, as is standard with these games. There is an initial boss fight that you can win, but you are largely expected to lose. You die, you get resurrected after a short cutscene, and then the game begins properly. However, I mention all this to tell you that at that point, there is actually a small tutorial to help guide new players. It is weirdly enough in a pit off to the side. But if you jump down there, the game will give you a small tutorial and explain some basics to you. And if you're new to this game, I highly recommend you use that to your advantage, as it is pretty useful. But now that the game has started and we're out in the open world, let's talk about that world with the world building section. Bar none, the world building in this game is incredible and it is the best part of this game. As much as this game is known for its combat and its difficulty, the world building is really the best part. The visuals are very distinctive and memorable. They stand out. They're very cinematic. The world itself is gigantic. It's easy to get lost in. There's tons to explore. But that said, an open world is an open world, and if you hand people an open world, they're going to find ways to abuse it, which is how we get things like the rune farming, which can honestly trivialize most of the game if you take advantage of it. Moreover, certain areas of the world are marked as safe areas, which means you can't attack or anything. This will keep you from killing certain NPCs, etc., which may or may not break the plot line, that type of stuff. But there are areas of the game where you cannot attack and kill everything. Now, sprinkled throughout the world are grace sites. These act as the... Elden Ring version of bonfires. This is where we're going to level up and access quite a few other features as we uncover them. Moreover, we can also fast travel to these sites, which makes them incredibly useful to unlock. As long as you are not in combat, you can fast travel to any grace site that you have already found, which by itself is already very, very nice. But this is also, again, where we're going to level up. Like all of the other From Software games, this is where we are going to be able to recharge our healing and mana flasks. Finding special items throughout the world will let you upgrade the charges of those flasks, as well as the amount that they heal. And you can actually allocate how many healing potions and how many mana potions you have at any given time, as you are given a set amount of charges per grace site rest, and you can determine on your own how many charges each of those things has. And that's the most integral stuff, but honestly that's just the tip of the iceberg for what you can do at these grace sites. But without giving away too much, I've hit the important stuff. Now moving on, let's talk about Torrent the Horse. So this is of course our speedy way to travel throughout the world. There are places you will be forcefully dismounted as you cannot ride a horse there. For the most part, Torrent is going to let you explore more quickly and you can actually of course engage in mounted combat on top of Torrent. And in fact, in some cases, is basically mandatory. There are a couple boss fights that you will more than likely be on horseback for the entire time. But you and Torrent will go around the rather large world map, and you will be discovering things like ruins, mini dungeons, minor erd trees, churches, and gigantic dungeons. So there's the basic ruins, which will just have items and then usually a chest nearby. Those are pretty nice. And then 
There are mini dungeons, which are usually labeled something something catacombs. These are just small little dungeons that require you to find a lever, which then opens a door that leads to a minor boss fight. And usually there's a decent reward at the end of them. Then there are the minor Erd trees. Erd trees give you tears after you defeat a boss that is present there. These tiers allow you to mix a special potion that is usable once per rest. It is customizable depending on what tiers you have access to and can change and vary accordingly and give you all sorts of benefits, but again, you only get one per rest. Then we have the churches. Churches are important because this is where we're going to find our sacred tiers primarily, which are going to increase the amount of healing that your flasks do. Sprinkled throughout the world, we can also find little golden trees that will actually also give you golden seeds, which is how you increase the charges of your flasks. And then there's the big proper dungeons. These are crazy. And I mean that because they are so well integrated into the open world, it is genuinely impressive because one second you're out exploring and the next thing you know, you're deep in Stormvale Castle tackling a proper Dark Souls dungeon. And they do this several times throughout the game. And it is genuinely impeccable how well they imposed these dungeons, big story-related dungeons, onto the actual world map and made it feel so natural, at least in terms of the layout. Now, including all of that stuff, we also have a Roundtable Hold. This serves as a sort of central hub. This is where your primary vendors are going to be. After resting at a few sites of grace, Molina will take you here, which is the NPC that gave you the ability to level up, etc. And the round table hold is full of all sorts of very useful stuff. You can actually change your appearance here super early in the game. Later on, after beating a certain boss, you can respec as well, but that's in a different location. But this is where pretty much all your vendors are. There's a smith that's going to allow you to upgrade your weapons, which is incredibly important. So you keep doing the appropriate amount of damage as smithing will increase the base amount of damage you're able to do with a weapon before you start looking at the scaling that is attributed to your attributes. So very important to smith and level up your weapons. There is a vendor here that will accept bell bearings and giving her those bell bearings will expand her inventory with what she has available to sell to you. So in this way, there is progression to the vendors as well as making sure that they stay relevant to your needs as you progress through the game. Then there are the Ashes of War. So in this game, each weapon has a special attack, which is activated by pressing whatever button for whatever controller scheme you happen to be using. However, Ashes of War are customizable to weapons. Weapons are not stuck with the special attack that they come with in most cases. They can actually be swapped out with these Ashes of War, which will grant them new special attacks, which makes them even more customizable than they were to begin with. And then there is the Finger Reader, which is a very weird name, but this game has all sorts of allusion to fingers and them being some sort of holy thing, which I assume is some sort of reference to the hand of God, if I had to guess. But nonetheless, the finger reader will do a few things for you. She acts as a special merchant for defeated bosses. You can often buy their armor from her after you've defeated them. And moreover, when you defeat special bosses, they often drop a remembrance and you can turn those remembrances into the finger reader to give you special equipment, usually that boss's weapon or a special spell that they might have been using. So if you haven't gathered by this point, there is so much to do in this game. So I've just rattled off all of the stuff you can find in the open world, all the stuff you can do at round table hold. There Honestly, though, is even more than that. I haven't even touched on the great runes or the divine towers that you need to go to to activate those runes. And to give a brief explanation, when you defeat the shard bearers, they will drop their version of the Elden Ring, which is their rune. However, you have to go activate it before you can use it, which grants you a very big bonus to usually something like your health, etc. There are bosses just roaming around out in the open world. There's a day-night cycle. Some bosses only show up at night. The, again, size of this game is genuinely immense, and it's very easy to get lost in it, which is why, to reiterate, the world building is the best part of this game. It is so unique, and it is so well laid out, at least geographically speaking. There's all these secrets you can find. There's optional bosses. And if you have the patience for it, the world is really something else to explore. However, the world is also filled with quests, and I do want to mention that specifically. There are quests throughout the game. There is no quest log, so it can be a little hard to keep track of your quests. So what I found personally was really useful was to go ahead and write them down in a journal. Like, you know, some sort of log for my quests. Like some sort of quest log, if you will. And I just felt like maybe if the game had one of those, it would have saved me some time writing in this journal next to my desk. But in all seriousness, I don't know why this game doesn't have a quest log. I really don't see what that would hurt. I get there are people who argue against no easy mode, etc. And generally speaking, I agree, but I genuinely don't know what having a quest log would really hurt that much. 
And I really feel like they could easily add something in that's at least vague enough to give you a reminder about what you were doing without spoiling it. They don't have to put in quest markers or anything like that, but they could at least give you some kind of note system at least. Or better yet, maybe take that messaging system that they already have in the game with the co-op and apply it to some sort of in-game journal and let you write this stuff down for yourself. My point is there are options and they did not help you out at all. However, while you're doing all this exploring and doing all this questing, you are naturally going to be coming up against that ever iconic Soulsborne combat. So let's talk about that next. It is very action focused. It is known for being very difficult. But as I've mentioned a couple times already, the difficulty of this game is however much you want it to be, because you are very capable of at any time stopping, going exploring somewhere else, grinding out runes, and basically just over leveling the challenge that you are stuck on. And in that way, I believe that if anyone has the patience to beat this game, they absolutely will. In fact, as a little bit of advice, if you are dying like 5-10 times to a boss, just stop trying, go level up, and come back. It's an open world, there's plenty to go out and do, you don't even have to farm if you don't want to, there's just a lot of stuff to do. Just come back when you're more leveled up and you will be fine. However, I do have some negatives to say about combat and we're going to get to those, but let's talk about some other things. For starters, combat largely starts with preparedness. You need to gear up, which involves the smith at the round table hold. You need to be making sure that your weapons stay upgraded. You need to make sure that you have some sort of build in mind, as just blindly raising stats isn't going to help you out. So you need to make sure that you are specifically building with a build in mind. I find that is just by itself very helpful if you know what you want to try to do. And remember your flasks, you can allocate how many charges you have to your healing and your mana, which means if you are not really using a lot of mana, maybe only have like two or three flasks for that and the rest all healing. Now that said, there is melee combat, there's ranged combat, and then there is magic build. So for starters, the build variety in this game is very, very high. So there's a nonsense amount of weapon types. All of those weapon types can be affixed with various ashes of war to give them various special attacks. Then there are ranged weapons, then there are sorceries, which is like your standard magic, and then there are incantations, both of which scale off of a different type of magic stat, faith and intelligence usually. Some of it scales off arcane though, so you do have to be a little careful there. Now that said, magic is ridiculous in this game. It is so strong, largely because a great number of the enemies are melee focused. There are not a lot of ranged enemies. There's a few, but they are vastly outnumbered by the melee guys, which makes your ability to come in at range very, very strong. To the point where magic builds, I would say, are quite frankly OP. They're very unbalanced in how good they actually are. Moreover, the game has a summoning system. Very early in the game, you can get a hold of a spirit bell as well as some ashes. Not ashes of war, but like spirit ashes. I don't know what you'd call them actually, but they're normally referred to as ashes. But there are tons of these throughout the game and they will allow you to summon summons at various points in the game. This is in addition to the other summoning available in previous games like summoning in spirits to help you with the boss fight. This is summoning in like minions that your character can use out in the open world and in most boss fights. These summons will distract the boss which makes using your ranged attacks or just getting hits in vastly easier. Which in combination with some of the spirits that you can still summon in to the boss fights, which was previous in the Dark Souls games, etc. Some of these bosses can be made very easy in that way. And broadly speaking, I do believe that the combat is very challenging, but it is very rewarding for overcoming that challenge. That is a sentiment that I absolutely agree with. I don't think they should tone the difficulty of this game down, because honestly, there are so many ways to overcome the difficulty of this game as it is, that I just believe that there is no need to add more difficulties to this because at that point it would be a different game. But that said, I will say, in my opinion, as someone who has 100%ed this game, quite a few of the bosses are simply poorly designed. A lot of them don't feel challenging, they feel cheap. And in particular, I'm talking about the last string or so of six or seven bosses related to the main story. Of like the last leg of bosses you're going to fight, I liked one of them. Now, I'm not going to go into details because I don't want to do spoilers. I might make a separate video talking about this specifically if people show interest in it. But I do genuinely believe a lot of the in-game bosses for the story are just cheap and they're not fun to fight. Which brings me to what is more than likely going to be my hottest take for this review. And that is that I think there comes a point where From Software is using the fact that their games are supposed to be difficult as a crutch for poor design in certain places. Because at the end of the day, if someone dies a lot because something is just honestly poorly optimized, then they're just hit with, oh, well, you got to get good or, you know, it's supposed to be difficult. 
But I think that argument at the same time blanketly invalidates that some of these bosses are not fun. They are not well designed. And while I'm on that note, I do also believe that some of the pacing of this game isn't great. You will constantly be hitting progression walls where you've advanced the story a little bit, and then the next area is just way beyond you, and you have to double back, and you have to go just do all the side stuff, and sometimes the story progression is just like very urgent in the way it is being handled, and yet now I've got to go do all the side stuff, and it creates a bit of dissonance, and this is something a lot of games struggle with, but I feel like they could have paced this out a little better, and it just feels a little jarring for a game that is otherwise so incredible with its world building. Now, last but not least, let's talk co-op, as that is a big part of Soulsborne games. Honestly, it works pretty much the way it works in every other one of their games. You will find items that are various versions of different types of fingers. This will allow you to summon in other characters, allow yourself to be summoned to other characters. This will allow you to invade other people's worlds, etc., etc. But there is this co-op element, there is this PvP element. And again, it works the same way it works in every other Soulsborne game that I've ever played. But I will mention, you do not have to engage with this system. You can't actually just play in offline mode. There's an option in the menu, at least for PC, to just turn it off. Now, I would argue that a decent amount of that and reading everybody's messages that are left around is kind of integral to the experience. But my point is, if you don't want to deal with that, you really don't have to. As for some people, being invaded is a really big nuisance. All right, so we've arrived at the opinions section of the video. I've tried to be mostly objective outside of one or two notes up to this point, but let's talk about the things I explicitly liked, the things I explicitly did not like, and then give a hard opinion. Now, on the positive side, I think the cinematic boss fights, these gorgeous open areas, the incredible world building and the lore, and all these incredible characters are really, really good positives. The exploration and then getting stronger and building your class up and overcoming these challenges, I think that is a really solid gameplay loop. And because of that, I think this game is rightfully getting a lot of praise. It is very, very good at that. However, on the negative side of things, there are points in this game where it just is not fun. There are times where, again, the bosses don't feel challenging, they feel cheap. And as a result of that, some of the mechanics around the boss fights are real hit or miss. Some of it works, some of it is just not well thought out, in my opinion. Another negative is that the magic system is just way too strong. Like, it's ridiculous how good that system is. Now, largely, I think they could keep it the same, but I think they need to tone the damage back a little bit. Like, I think in general, anyone attacking from ranged should have an advantage over a melee character, but the length at which it is better is a little too much, in my opinion. Moreover, for playing on PC, there were some bugs. Now, they are actively working on this, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. But on PC, there was a lot of stuttering. Late game, I crashed all the time. In fact, typically what would happen is during the phase switch of boss fights, there's usually a cinematic to go along with that phase switch. And there was like a 50-50 shot of my game just crashing during that, which got very annoying very quickly, as you might imagine. But all of that said, let's draw a broad conclusion. The base game is $60, at least on Steam, and honestly, yeah, it's absolutely worth that price. However, I think if you want to get the most out of this game and actually expect to beat it, you need to be willing to go into it with a willingness to either learn and or overcome those challenges, because this game is incredibly frustrating at parts. There are times, again, I just don't think the game is fun. I think some of the bosses are poorly designed, but broadly speaking, at the same time, the world building is incredible. I loved wandering around and exploring with all its different biomes. It's just gorgeous scenery. The incredibly cinematic bosses, regardless of whether or not they're good, are honestly a sight to behold. And the exploration and slow power growth reward system is very good at what it does. And because of those things, do I think the game is worth the money? Absolutely. However, I say that knowing full well that if you do not like a Soulsborne title, you are not going to like Elden Ring. It is basically just the same. It's a bit more accessible. It's a bit easier to get into. It's easier to overcome the challenges, yes. But it is still a Soulsborne game. And as such, if you don't like those games, you're not going to like this. There are times I didn't like this. And again, my biggest criticism just across the board of this approach to games is that I honestly feel like From Software is getting to a point where they're using the fact that their games are supposed to be difficult to hand wave away bad design. And that comes from somebody who 100%ed the game. I do not feel that telling people to get good or just be better at it 
is really the appropriate way to address them. I also don't think that From Software should lower the difficulty by any means, because at that point, it's a different game. But there comes a point where you have to decide between, is this boss difficult or is it genuinely not good? And I'm very curious to hear or see anything about how From Software comes to that decision internally, because frankly, it seems like a real mixed bag on the result. And then broadly speaking about the Soulsborne genre, not necessarily this game, but I feel like they're not really advancing game mechanics very much. That said, guys, that is all I've got for you. I genuinely hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it useful. I hope you learned some things or have a better opinion about how you feel about this game. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. Maybe consider joining the channel as a member. But honestly, regardless of any of that, even if you disliked it, thank you for watching. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.